Free Coaching Friday. It's that time. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> and today, I'm going to start talking about how and why you can actually hack pretty much all hardware. And by hack all hardware, I mean you can hack all hardware. And there are very specific reasons why you can hack all <laughs> hardware. So I'm going to tell everyone a few secrets and kind of dig into that, especially because the number one topic of the week has been all around the fact that NVIDIA bought a company called Arm. Now, if some of you might not know what NVIDIA is, NVIDIA is, well, you know what, I'll just, I'll just show this. For those who, who don't necessarily know about this yet, who are a little behind on things, uh, I'll move my face, but there's this, uh, company called NVIDIA here and they bought this company called Arm for 40 billion dollars and so that's been causing me a, an ocean of questions and very good ones at that because people have been asking you know how does this impact Raspberry Pi all these different things and we had a launch party earlier and since uh, for those who are in the Nosha squad I'm not going to spend too much time talking about things that we covered in our launch party just yesterday. We're going to spend more time instead talking about multi-architecture uh, hardware hacking. <laughs> and basically just the foundation of basically what makes hardware the thing that makes everything. Makes everything work. Makes the internet exists. Makes all of those bits uh, be a thing. So I know some of you are just joining. So for those of you who are on the YouTube side, uh, if, I, if I have time, I try to get to the YouTube stuff. But really, I answer questions in uh, my Facebook group, the Nosha Squad. Uh, the details for joining the Nosha Squad, I should probably add those to the, well, to the details in the, in the YouTube group. But anyways, uh, for anyone who is in the Facebook group and asking questions, I will answer questions that everyone asks because that's what we do during Free Coaching Friday is I try to answer all of the questions that are being thrown at me and then I also answer all of the questions of the week. So because it is now that time when cybersecurity meets hardware and IT and cloud and all of these different things with this new big event. This company, NVIDIA, is oftentimes best known for producing graphics cards in the consumer market. Uh, NVIDIA does a lot more than that. They're a chip manufacturing company. Now, for those of you who know much about computers, there are different chips that uh, computers have that allow the computer to do what it needs to do. We have companies like Intel, they produce chips. We have companies like AMD, they produce chips. And then we have a company called NVIDIA that produces chips that bought another processor and chip manufacturing company called ARM, and that's what's going on. And so if you have a laptop or you have a desktop or some standard uh, normal modern computer, like an end user computer, chances are it is running an AMD or Intel processor, which is a big deal. It's a big deal because it influences how that hardware is hacked. It influences how that hardware works. It influences how it's defended, protected, what kinds of applications can run on it. And so if you don't understand the foundation of hardware architecture and things like what processor is used for what, how to make a processor that doesn't normally talk to a different type of processor communicate to something else, uh, if anyone here has a Raspberry Pi, you might have noticed that when you try to install some applications like, say, Google Chrome, if you try to install Google Chrome on a Raspberry Pi, you'll notice that the Raspberry Pi comes, if you install the default operating system that they make for it called Raspberry Pi OS, it comes with something called Chromium, and it doesn't actually come with Google Chrome. And if you try to install Google Chrome on a Raspberry Pi, this, this is where we start to crack into hardware hacking and the essence of it is Google Chrome will not run on a Raspberry Pi. You'll find that out. And so if you try to install it, you know, you'll, just, you'll see errors. It just won't work. Now, there are some things that can cause the Raspberry Pi to be able to use Google Chrome, but 
you have to do things like you have to either emulate something or you, you have to maybe throw it in a certain type of docker container but it, there's a puzzle piece to figure out why will this one piece of software that works on say like a, a laptop or a desktop or a server why does it suddenly not really work on say like a raspberry pi and see with nvidia buying arm the raspberry pi uses this chip this technology called arm and so now we have nvidia intel and amd is like the the giants for computing part in processor development these are now the three giants and nvidia is actually now on the investor charts the the world's most valuable chip manufacturer as of this month so the processor type in the raspberry pi as of this month is owned by the world's m officially <laughs> most most valuable uh, chip development company from a, a monetary standpoint on the chart so if anyone wants to go and look at like the investor charts are all those things a lot of people are freaking out and inv investing in nvidia right now <laughs> and i mean it's a 40 billion dollar deal and so if our challenge right now is that say even simple applications don't work on a raspberry pi and nvidia is buying the technology that say like the raspberry pi is founded on one of the challenges with the raspberry pi is that it's taken a lot of time for it to get adopted into the mass market because it doesn't use chips that are compatible with other things without some extra legwork and so if you want to learn how all hardware works learning how to make things work on say a raspberry pi that shouldn't or going and finding something that's maybe made for raspberry pi like trying to install raspberry pi applications made only for raspberry pi if you try to do these things there's a lesson here there's a lesson involved with trying to make these things work together in ways that they really shouldn't because it, it's it's just a it's a very fascinating thing um, one thing that uh, maybe next week I'll spend a little more time on is I want to talk about my favorite way to learn ethical hacking but before we get into my favorite way to learn ethical hacking just like bar none I think it's really fun I think it's pretty neat and it's a real world way to learn actual real ethical hacking but before I get into that I need to talk about the fact that when you're trying to learn ethical hacking and you're trying to learn all of these different things, you're trying to learn Python, you're trying to learn Golang, it's just really important to understand how does this work down to the hardware. Now, if we take a look at system diagnostics, because I have a Raspberry Pi system running right here. So right now I have a Raspberry Pi running software that needs quite a bit of love in order for it to work on something and one thing i'm going to say is the easiest way to start checking out things that work on something that they shouldn't is is going and finding something that someone else built first uh, so one thing that you can check out is there's this tool called nagios core uh, and the first recommendation I'm going to just make for everyone is to check out something called NEMS Linux. And NEMS Linux lets you take a look at what your hardware is doing on whatever you install it on. Uh, and you can install NEMS Linux on all kinds of things. So if I go and uh, check, I'll, I'll put a link for what uh, NEMS Linux is in the Facebook group. And then uh, when I uh, finish doing the stream, I'll, I'll try to add that link in the Facebook details too. But if I go and type uh, NEMS linux.com i think it's just nemslinux.com and i'll like i said i'll put this in the facebook group for everyone who's there to see what this is this is a tool that lets us take a look at hardware different types of hardware what's going on with the different types of hardware what kinds of errors are showing up no matter what we're running on it are we running software is the software generating errors bugs what's going on with it and typically, this is something that would be a little bit of a pain to get running on a Raspberry Pi. And so if you're trying to get into hardware hacking, the first thing that I'm going to say is check out this thing called NEMS Linux. It's free. And download it and put it on whatever you would like to put it on. You can put it on a Raspberry Pi per with this drop down showing here. You could put it on a, 
a virtual appliance. So you don't even need to get a Raspberry Pi if you don't want to, to take a look at your hardware. And as soon as you install NEMS Linux, someone took a bunch of software packages and did things to them to make this work on different types of hardware. And so you'll notice even when you go to install NEMS Linux, you'll notice that they have different installer packages and the reason why there's all these different types of installer packages goes all the way back to the hardware. And I would even recommend maybe trying to make a NEMS Linux virtual machine and maybe trying to make a NEMS Linux AWS server and maybe trying to make a NEMS Linux Raspberry Pi and just see what happens. See how everything looks different. See how everything might look the same. And Inevitably, what you're going to run into is NEMS Linux lets you build little dashboards and start doing things like analyzing traffic into your hardware, seeing what's going on with your hardware and your traffic and all these different things, uh, analyzing queries. And so I can see when I've had critical hardware failures right here. I had a critical failure on the 12th on the hard. It's a hardware related failure, uh, hardware related failure on the 15th. And if we are doing things that look at hardware, if something impacts the hardware, it impacts every single thing that we deal with. So if we think about, it doesn't really matter, I'm streaming to both YouTube and Facebook right now. If all of a sudden Facebook or YouTube just suddenly just stopped working and no one could access it for like even an hour, it would be on the news. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of, <laughs> one of the first things about security and cybersecurity and hacking is whoever defends the hardware, that's the first step to defending the software. And then whoever hacks the hardware has complete control of the software. And this is the foundation of ethical hacking is understanding how everything crunches down into systems. And so we can take a deeper look at what NEMS Linux even lets us take a look at our systems. And we can deep dive into our system, what it's doing more than just, do we have critical errors? Uh, what types of things might be working, might not be working? Let's, let's take a deeper look at this real quick because this is just the beginning of ethical hacking. And I don't wanna overwhelm everyone too much. So we're gonna focus more on NEMS Linux today and then I will start to talk a little bit about multi-architecture engineering and what makes it possible, but we're, we're gonna focus on hardware, how to analyze hardware, how to uh, do diagnostics on it, and even how to find different types of vulnerabilities that might mean that as an ethical hacker, we might have gateways and things that might let us manipulate a system to make it do something that maybe it really shouldn't be doing. And as an ethical hacker, this is just something that we do. We want things to do things that they probably wouldn't normally do because that's awesome. I mean, why not? Uh, so you can make new, pro you can repurpose things into new products. So let's take a look at some of these other things in here. Um, so let me move my face. This is a, uh, something I haven't really generated any events on yet, but this is a tactical dashboard that just shows, hey, you know, how many things are we protecting? How many things are we monitoring? Notice that this says one out of one on uh, hosts up. You can actually set up one NEMS Linux system and then try to learn how to monitor hardware on remote systems that aren't running NEMS Linux because NEMS Linux is capable of monitoring however many systems that you're able to set up its monitoring for. So that does mean that you can also use NEMS Linux to see if there are strange anomalies for any other system in your environment that you either want to defend or attack or whatever your goal is. If you're a pen tester, you're gonna attack. If you're cyber defense, then you're going to defend. And so, you know, instead of having one thing, maybe try setting up five, maybe try setting up 10 different things and monitoring all the data with it. And then NEMS Linux has a couple of uh, reporting features that are quite nice. Let's see. Let me pull up. So when we're taking a look at NEMS Linux, there's this old, 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 one of the most widely adopted technologies in IT, 
one of the most widely adopted technologies in IT is called Nagios. Nagios Core is an open source version of Nagios. And what Nagios is, is it's just a monitoring tool. And uh, notice that it says right here, NEMS Nagios Core. So if anyone's ever worked in IT before and done you know, system administration, you may or may not have noticed Nagios Core in places because it's something that lets people who do operations so if you're an operations engineer you're an operations engineer if you if you've never used Nagios core you've probably used something else like it that basically looks at like system diagnostics and lets you see what's going on and so right here we've got a few red items under notifications we've got a few uh, red items under event handlers and there's all these random options in here but the whole purpose of all of this is we, you know, as an ethical hacker or as a cybersecurity professional, red team, blue team, and this is why I focus on purple team. I teach purple team skills because it doesn't really matter whether you want to defend or whether you want to attack. The skills are the same. The skills are generally the same. And so we can take a look at, uh, you know, details on the, on the host hardware and its services and everything that it's doing. Um, and I can just click on various things. So let's see, we have uh, details on the different pieces of software that are running on the system. And we can tell, uh, is, is there a compromised piece of software? Right here, I can see that uh, SSH is running on this system, which means that there's a potential vulnerability where someone could hack into the system because this thing right here called SSH is present. And I can even, even drill down into this SSH tool and take a look at more details with this thing. And this right here is something that I would want to keep my eye on if I was an administrator, because this means that this system could potentially be compromised. Immediately, this is just something that we need to think about. So, you know, if I'm trying to secure a system or hack a system, if I'm trying to hack a system and I see using a tool like Nagios Core that a remote system that I'm analyzing has this SSH service on there, well, I have a wide open door to hop on to another system and the vast majority of systems so this is something that i'm going to tread lightly on because my goal is keep it consensual guys don't do anything illegal i'm going to talk about some things that can be done but i'm going to also say don't break the law because people can also find out that you've done things too so just because you can do something doesn't mean that it's a good idea or that you should and just because you can hack there's a right place and a right time. <laughs> so I don't, I, it's, I don't, I'm not trying to send anyone to, to prison or anything here. So what I'm about to say, don't go and, and, and just do this sort of thing randomly. So if you were to go to a grocery store, any old grocery store, you could go to, especially in, in certain countries like the United States, some grocery stores take cash only. It really depends. Uh, like if you're in another country that's not, um, that doesn't use like those automated cash register checkout deals whatever they are um, if you go to a grocery store that has like the automated checkouts if you access like let, let's say that you uh open up the little lock front on it because a lot a lot of them have a little lock front and sometimes they don't even lock them you can get like a usb or something an interface with the little device like with, with the little cash register systems and they run windows it's just windows and uh, a lot of them run a flavor of windows some of them nowadays have arm processors some of them have amd or intel processors as well but if you wanted to go and hack a grocery store by basically like dropping something on the little self checkout things then you can see like everything that everyone's checking out you can steal credit card information that's terrible don't do it uh, and like I said, you will go to jail if you were to do this sort of thing, and someone will be able to find out that you've been doing these things. <laughs> so, so just because it, it, you can do it doesn't mean that it's a smart thing to do. Uh, but you can most certain <laughs> you can most certainly do that because systems run operating systems, and this is actually one of the most interesting things to me. Is I don't know if anyone in the group knows this exactly, but. Did you know that if we go and take a look at, uh, let's see, I'm just going to say, if we go and take a look at an NVIDIA graphics card, because if we're talking about hardware hacking, 
I want to talk about hardware hacking. And by hardware, I mean, is it hardware? If the answer is yes, you can hack it. And then the question beyond that is how? <laughs> so graphics cards, you might think that, okay, so to hack a graphics card, it has to be you know plugged into a computer and different things. Did you know, uh, for those of you who know, uh, have ever messed with a graphics card or anything along those lines, since we're talking about NVIDIA, we're talking about ARM, the company that makes these graphics card is the company that bought ARM and they have a little operating system on them. Not only do they have a little operating system on these cards, did you know that you can put your own input output system, little operating system on a graphics card that you yourself made? Now, whether or not you ruin the voltage tables on there, you can manually adjust the voltage tables. Uh, you, can, you can do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, you can take these things apart and liquid cool it and then go and put like a special OS on one of these little NVIDIA cards. Uh, really, like there's all kinds of stuff you can do. If you've ever heard someone say, uh, you know, flash a BIOS on something, a BIOS is a form of an operating system. It's really basic, but, you know, it's no different from the fact that graphics cards have a chip. And if you go to the grocery store, those little machines for the self-checkouts, they have chips. And then also like the little systems, like the card systems, one of the things that's a real pain, because I, I, I used to do PCI defense, which is a payment card industry. So if I say, uh, I'll just show you a, a visual of what I'm talking about. So like uh, credit card readers, we'll say PCI credit card readers. When you're trying to do like pen testing for like companies that receive credit card information and they need to be compliant to receive credit card information and all of this stuff. Well, notice that there's little buttons on these and notice that there's little screens on these. What this means, once again, is that there's an operating system on this. And if there's an operating system on here, if you can figure out how to make something that can work with the processor that lives on that, you can overclock it, you can hack it, you can do all kinds of stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, one of our Pied hackers took apart a TI-83 calculator, TI-83 calculator. If anyone's ever heard of a TI-83 calculator, you can actually liquid cool and overclock these things. And so uh, one of our students took it apart and is just thinking about how to do that. If you feel like telling everyone who you are, then I'll, but if you want your privacy, I won't, I won't tell everyone who you are. It's up, up to you. <laughs> but you can hack a TI-83 calculator. And uh, I mean, ultimately, it it's the same skill set when we're talking about chips and hardware because everything has to talk to the chips essentially in binary and so these are all things that we want to consider and we can take a look at information associated with processes uh, we you know we can take a look at uh, all kinds of stuff really I mean this uh, and, and I won't uh, bore everyone with all of the even though this stuff is uh, valuable and useful and all of those things. It's not the most entertaining thing to look at. <laughs> it's like watching someone actually do real like live pen testing. If anyone has ever actually watched someone else do real live pen testing, unless you like know about as much as the person who's pen testing knows, it's really boring. And even if you do know as much, it's just really boring. You're just watching people type things and deep dive and look through oceans of data. Really, it's the results that are the exciting part of hacking. Hacking itself is maybe one of the most boring things that you, when you think about it that way. And uh, one other thing that I do want to introduce, uh, let's see, is I'm, I'm gonna bring up Steam here <laughs> because I wanna talk about how I learned how to start doing hardware hacking uh, and really, this kind of leads into what I'm going to bring up next week. Because next week, I'm going to talk about some fun ways to learn how to do some hardware hacking with video games. I learn most of my hacking with video games. And I've even been paid to hack video games a number of times. Uh, and I've also helped 
uh, with Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, let's see what other games. That was the biggest one. I've helped with a few other little like indie games and things like that. But video games, quite frankly, are one of, in my opinion, like the most fascinating and fun ways to kind of ease into trying to understand how hardware works. Because if you look at a game, let's let's go ahead and look at a game. If you can make something do something that it's not supposed to do, that's uh, that's hardware hacking. That's that's hacking in general. So first, I'm just going to click on something. Now, I'm bear with me. I'm not going to like. I'm not saying that someone should buy something or not buy something. This right now is just me showing you the part that's relevant to computing here because if. It doesn't matter if it's a video game or an enterprise piece of software. If we go and we take a look at... Oh, it doesn't zoom in. Well, you might have to, like, squint to see the text on my screen here uh, where it says system requirements is where I'm looking, where my mouse is highlighting. When we take a look at system requirements, notice that it gives us a type of operating system. And then notice... This is a really important one. It says processor. I don't know if anyone has ever really put much thought into why the processor type is listed beyond you know how fast is the processor. Because if you talk for for those of you who are gamers, some of you know a little more about architecture. Some of you have don't know anything about architecture. Everyone's at different levels. But for those who don't know anything about architecture, uh, what you'll probably think when you see this is, oh, you just have to have a processor that's fast enough. Well, not just that, having a processor that's fast enough isn't enough. It, if this were to say processor and it said Intel and then it didn't say AMD and then someone went and tried to play this on a non-Intel processor, then the game just might not even work. And this has to do with what we're talking about today, which is processors, which is hardware. And hardware has to work on things um in this one i tried the control zoom but i'm actually in steam i would I, I could make it bigger if i here let me do this i can make it bigger if i just go to steam in a browser instead steampower.com so if i pull up in a browser it'll let me zoom in on something this this is better this is much better so let's let's do this this will actually be able to see this you know what let's click on terraria because Terraria, in theory, is something that can run on a Raspberry Pi. But, more likely than not, it would require a significant amount of work to get Terraria to work on a Raspberry Pi because of what I'm talking about. And so this is where I'm going to give everyone a little bit of homework because uh, I've never really given anyone homework before and Free Coaching Friday, but I'm going to start giving everyone optional homework for things that you can try when F Free Coaching Friday is over <laughs> uh, so that you can go and actually learn something, but real world stuff because, I mean, why wouldn't we want to learn real world stuff? So we're taking a look at system requirements in Steam. And why am I showing Steam and why am I showing video games? This is like one of the things that pretty much everyone has access to. Uh, if you've ever played a video game or if you have a laptop that, if you have a laptop, I can probably play Terraria. Um, so if we take a look at uh, where it says uh, required OS here, uh, processor is what I was looking at. Notice this one says processor 2.0 gigahertz. And it doesn't say Intel or AMD. I guess it's probably useful that I showed the other one before because the other game, and maybe I'll open up another game in another uh, window after this, the fact that this says processor 2.0 gigahertz means that this game will probably work on just about anything. And someone asked what homework. So I'll just tell you the homework now because I was going to tell you at the end of this because uh, why not? And then I'll say it again. The homework is going to be uh, for those of you who have Steam or for those of you who have who game, I, I think it's easier to do with games. I could try to say find some piece of software, but find a game that shouldn't run on, say, another piece of hardware that you have. So, like, let's say that you have uh, different types of laptops, especially for those of you who have a Raspberry Pi and then, uh, say, like a desktop. Try to take something that technically shouldn't run on a Raspberry Pi, including like Steam. If you can try to figure out how to get Steam to work 
on a Raspberry Pi. Actually, maybe that's the first challenge because I, I, I spent so much time trying to get Steam to work on a Raspberry Pi and it's a real pain and I'm not going to say anything about it yet until next week. <laughs> uh, but what I will say for now is I'm going to send everyone on a little bit of a down a rabbit hole of like if you have a Raspberry Pi, try to get Steam to run on it. If you don't have a Raspberry Pi, let's see some other things that you can try. Try to for those of you who know what a virtual machine is, try to get the Raspberry Pi OS, like its operating system, to work in a virtual machine on something that's not a Pi. So that's the other homework for anyone who doesn't have a Raspberry Pi. So that basically, I just want you to take something that shouldn't be compatible with your hardware. And I want you to learn how to make it compatible with your hardware. There's a lot of different approaches. You could consider something called emulation. You could try to figure out how multi-architecture engineering works with Docker. It, really, you're going to have to lean on Google and things like that. Um, but notice uh, it says system requirements, Windows, shows a 2.0 gigahertz. If I click on uh, Mac OS, uh, notice that it has uh, different options for system requirements. It says Mac OS X and then it says Steam OS plus Linux. The reason why all of these, you know, between Windows, Mac, Steam, all of these different things, the, the different operating systems talk to hardware in different ways. And so operating system matters and then the type of hardware that you have matters. Those two things impact compatibility. And if you understand how operating systems work and how hardware compatibility with operating systems work and just different types of software that sh should work on something, um, those are some things to think about. So uh, anyways, for those who have a, a Raspberry Pi, try to see if you can get Steam running on it. Uh, and then uh, if anyone wants something, wants me to give them a task for something to to run not on not on a Raspberry Pi, so for those who don't have a Raspberry Pi, feel free to direct message me. Um, you can direct message me on LinkedIn, on in, in Facebook. It doesn't really matter where. Uh, and then on Free Coaching Fridays, anyone who wants to participate in the chat, then you can go ahead and, and participate that way. So just to kind of show you a, a little bit of what leads into this. So when you're trying to figure out, like, how in the world do I make something compatible with something that it's not otherwise compatible with, like getting Steam to work on a Raspberry Pi? Uh, I just want to go to Docker Hub and do a search. So if I go to Docker Hub and I just say explore on Docker Hub, and uh, this, this is just me showing you an example of some things that you can consider if you are trying to figure out how to make things compatible uh, with other things. So if we go to this website for Docker, hub.docker.com, if you're in uh, Facebook, I sent a link in the chat for everyone. If we take a look at just what we have in here, take a look at all these, these different items. You notice that Docker lets us install things like Ubuntu. Docker also lets us go and install things like MySQL and all these different bits. Uh, if I were to go even further, we can see that there's applications in here. For anyone who's done IT before, you might have seen Nginx before. It's just a, an application of, of many, one of many applications. Uh, you can get Python packages in Docker containers. Uh, you can get CentOS, you know, entire different types of operating systems that are different from the hardware's host operating system that you're using. And then if I click into one of these, so let me just click on uh, Ubuntu real quick. When I click on this, and even before I click on it, it has all these tags. And if I make this bigger, there, that's bigger. If I take a look at this, we can we can actually take this Ubuntu right here, and we can install Ubuntu, and then we can try to install Steam in Ubuntu, which then that poses another challenge because it still might not work, and there are reasons for that too, which is something to you know try to wrap your head around. But notice right here it shows uh, Ubuntu. It says container, and then Linux, and then ARM64, and then this says power 
PC64LE386 ARM x86-64, all, all these different things. And then if I scroll down here, we can see that we have uh, these things that say image, and then they say OS Arch, which stands for Operating System and Architecture. Uh, and we can see that this shows that it's for Linux. Uh, if Linux so happens to be running on uh, AMD64, you know, I can scroll down here and really is just saying that uh, this is a Linux based item. So it's based on Linux and then it requires this hardware. Uh, and each and every one of these, basically Ubuntu, if I try to install Ubuntu on a Raspberry Pi or a desktop or any of these other things, it will just work. But you know what won't work is I created a container and this is another thing that uh, anyone can try this too. If I go over to the container that I use for development and all that is this Inner Athena. It's part of our Olympiad uh, platform. This Inner Athena container right here. Notice that it just has, let's see if I go to tags right here. Notice that it only has OS uh, Arch ARM. This right here is really relevant. It'll work on you know 64-bit ARM processors or 32-bit ARM processors but there's a reason why I designed it this way so this this might be another challenge for those who don't have a Raspberry Pi um, I'll make a link to how to get to this inner Athena item too but if you can figure out how to get this inner Athena item right here to run on say like an, a normal desktop or laptop then for those who don't have a Raspberry Pi, that's a little more sophisticated and a little more complicated than trying to get Steam to run on a trying to get Steam to run on a Raspberry Pi. But for those of you who are really trying to learn this stuff, and some of you are developers and whatnot, anyways, so if you're trying to just up your game and really get into it, then you know this is some options. So I will go ahead and share this in the Facebook group as well. And so if you can figure out how to get this to run on a you know, normal system, then this is a first step into learning how to make all hardware do what you want the hardware to do and, and make hardware run applications that that hardware maybe or probably really shouldn't be running in the first place. And sometimes it might not run well, but the point is if you can get something running on something that it shouldn't be running on, the amount of business value in that, this means that like their entire companies, like all these companies right now, I'll tell you a secret. The reason why this whole arm thing is such a big deal and the reason why I'm really pushing this right now is a lot of companies like Steam, for example, are going to be trying to find engineers who can work with ARM, especially companies like Steam. So if you've ever wanted to work for Steam, and that's like a, a, a life dream that you've had, honestly, this is probably going to be one of the easiest ways to get a high-end job working at a company like Steam where you help them build their technology to work with ARM so that, you know, things like Steam can work natively on things like a Raspberry Pi because you'd better believe that the company NVIDIA that makes graphics cards and Steam, the company Steam, you'd better believe that they're watching NVIDIA like a hawk. And when they see these things, they're like, money. And it's a business. I mean, and if you're trying to get a job, you do the things that make the businesses money. And the skills that make the businesses the most money are the things that are the easiest to get jobs in. And the things that make businesses the most money are usually things that just came out, just happened, and no one else knows what it is. Because the, this interesting reality in the tech sphere is that, just like most things, most people don't like trying new things. So... A superpower that all beginners in the cybersecurity or tech sphere have is if a beginner starts to understand that if they get if they focus almost exclusively on the latest things and the newest technologies that no one's cracked into yet, 
The superpower is that no one's cracked into it yet, and the other superpower is that it's not possible, for example, for someone to have 10 years of experience using Docker with ARM. Because Docker, it's been around for a while, but Docker really started supporting ARM in 2018. There's no such thing as someone who's been working with Docker for longer than I have, because 2018, like I was working with the ARM processing systems and Docker before they worked together, and then other people who've been doing that stuff. Well, there you go. So all of you, this is a brand new thing that barely anyone's tapped into, that barely anyone's been doing, and companies right now are trying to find people who can do this, because this is the thing that's stressing companies out right now, and everyone's going to want to respond to the big thing, and this is the big thing, is that NVIDIA got bought out, or bought out ARM for that, you know, that $40 billion deal. And so I, I really just wanted to make Free Coaching Friday uh, just really specific to that and just kind of really let everyone know, like, what can you quite literally start doing to, I mean, quite literally make yourself much more valuable than almost anyone else on the market right now. And one other interesting thing, like, we're growing. Notia Point's growing. We're growing rapidly, but I'm still not that big yet in the grand scheme of things. So almost anyone who's working with anything that we do is learning stuff that barely anyone knows until we get bigger and then that's going to pose a, a complication for our own customers too as we get bigger and other people all know the same things then you know we're going to have to innovate our programs and really like our newest programs are going to be the ones that are going to be more valuable than our existing past things uh, and so you just got to keep up on and that's that's a thing that people can love or hate about technology is that if you aren't keeping if you don't like learning new things or trying to pick up the new thing, in technology you become obsolete and this is a this is the challenge point for people who aren't new in cybersecurity because people will get into cybersecurity, they'll get into software engineering, they'll get into technology and then everything that they've done starts to become obsolete and then they think back to the sheer amount of effort that it took to get to where they are and it's like, oh, do I really have to do this all over again? Do I really have to learn all these things? And so, but for some of us, like for me, it's like, I love learning. So if, if I have an opportunity to just get paid to just constantly learn, I mean, that's why I do what I do. I'm like, oh sweet, I wanna learn. If someone's already done it, it then it's, it's not that exciting to me. Uh, and so I prefer to find the new thing, get the big businesses to adopt that, and then teach everyone what the big businesses are adopting. And so like Microsoft and uh, other companies are in the race to jump on this too. So if someone wants to get a job at say Microsoft, learning ARM will get you a job working toward the top because that's where they're, where they're trying to implement these things because it hasn't trickled down to have help desk support. It's all experimental, it's all research-based. And if you want experimental jobs, if you want research-based jobs, learn how to hack the hardware, learn how to build the hardware, Learn how to make the hardware work with what you want the hardware to work with because that's what companies hire is the person who will make their stuff work with more things and increase you know the compatibility and increase the enrollment uh, so that more users can adopt it and more people can use the technology and more platforms can support it because that's what technology companies want is they want enrollment technology companies want maximum user enrollment and it's also just a survival thing if they don't focus on that like businesses just go out of business so this is why i do what i do in general it's just i'm i i very specifically have a few unusual obsessions my biggest one being hardware hacking is by far my favorite thing uh, and so some other things you can do is like learn how to play with overclocking for those of you who want to get into hardware hacking. If you are scared to damage expensive equipment with overclocking, try overclocking an inexpensive system. You could get a, you can get cheap systems on eBay to practice overclocking with. Raspberry Pis you can uh, practice overclocking with. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying to learn overclocking as a hardware hack for the very first time in your life with um, a really expensive system. Uh, I've ruined many systems and, and I've, I've, I have actually 
cause multi-million dollar failures in environments and thought I was going to get fired over this stuff. And so you'll find that when you do this type of work, you do cause companies to both make and lose millions of dollars. And when, when you do get into this type of work, just, just wait till you sweat those bullets. The first, I want, I want someone to tell me their first million dollar loss when you guys get there. Cause like I, I I'll, I'll, I'll tell my story. Um, this was actually really stressful. I was working on a power grid. I can't say where, uh, but I, it was, it, does anyone know what a dark site is? I used to work on a lot of dark sites. Uh, I'll talk about dark sites after after this. So let me tell you about what problem I had when I lost like a couple million dollars for a company I worked at. I'm at this power grid. And at this time, like it was allergy season and I have bad allergies. And I mean like bad allergies. And for whatever reason, this one particular area. Oh, and a good question. Is ARM meant to always be small form factor? No, ARM is not actually technically uh, small form factor it happens to produce small form factor chips and it happens to make most of its money on small form factor chips like cell phones and raspberry pies but believe it or not arm has a very strong presence in the bitcoin and crypto mining community and there are massive farms and data centers filled with full-size arm servers uh, and server environments that are all arm uh, and another thing to know about ARM is uh, NVIDIA specializes in something called graphics acceleration where you can basically have a graphics card that streams, um, that can stream video like, like a Netflix stream. And NVIDIA also has something called GeForce Now. And one of the limitations in that technology that NVIDIA has never been able to get around is that NVIDIA is dependent on AMD and Intel for that technology to grow in the direction that they would hope it could grow in at an affordable rate, way, shape, and form. Well, now that NVIDIA owns ARM, you better believe that ARM will probably be the most heavily supported uh, chip architecture for graphics acceleration. And I have a, a, a specific interest in graphics acceleration. My entire apartment and home is based off of graphics acceleration architectures and designs. Um, even uh, VMware, I use uh, NVIDIA for graphics acceleration myself. I'll just show you my graphics acceleration configuration if it loads. So I'm using some NVIDIA graphics acceleration because it's something that I really like. Why didn't go away thing? This is annoying. So let me go to, uh, I just want to look at the configuration settings. It's going to bark at me. Will you let me go in the settings? Maybe not. Well, I probably should have shut this thing down or something. Actually, you know what? Let me see if I can, I'll just say, I don't know, let me close one of these windows. Oh, there we go. I had two windows open. So let me pull up something and show you uh, what graphics acceleration is in a configuration. I This is a, this is a hypervisor that you're looking at, this VMware, and Let's see, our processors, ah, here we go. Right here, this is really kind of small, so once again, you might have to squint or zoom in on this, and this is something that I can't really zoom in on. It's not one of those things. Uh, it says graphics memory here, and for the first time, we're seeing more hypervisor graphics acceleration where a graphics card, so this system has two graphics cards in it from NVIDIA. It has one graphics card that's wired to send two gigabytes of RAM straight to a, a specific virtual machine. And then the other graphics card is just dedicated for running this stream that we're running on. So I'm sending graphics acceleration stream. And for those of you who have certain types of browsers, uh, your browser is using my graphics card right now. That, that's a really interesting conundrum to think about right there because of the way that I've configured it. So those of you watching, depending on who's watching and what you're watching on, you're using my graphics card 
because of the technology that I'm talking about. That's right. It's a, it's one of the strangest things. Uh, it's a good old technology. So anyways, the time that I got in trouble and lost a lot of money, because you guys, when you get in this type of work, you're going to lose a lot of money for companies. And it, it's real stressful and it's, it's not really fun. <laughs> so I'm, I'm at this power grid. I get real sick. And by real sick, I mean like you know, I ended up getting like a cold and then I ended up getting like bronchitis and then my allergies were hitting me so hard and I'm sitting here at this power grid and the funny thing about power grids, you can't just go to the bathroom at a power grid. If you try to go to the bathroom at a power grid, the security guards usually at most power grids have to come with you. So like if you're sick and like yakking and things like that and you're having just a bad day, you just got this person following you around whether you have like stomach issues and you're like stuck in the stall and they're like so how you doing and <laughs> so you just got the security guard just hanging out with you uh all the time <laughs> which is which is fine but when you're really sick it can be a, a little frustrating and long story short with the amount of time that i was out at the site i didn't complete the jobs and tasks that i had and uh, basically all of the things <laughs> it does kind of feel like prison working in dark sites and i'll outline what a dark site is in, in a sec here um but yeah i i just couldn't finish the work that i was supposed to do and i was i was working on a an incidents response and disaster recovery project and so basically this company their infrastructure just like tanked and then i'm the specialist who goes out and saves like things that are destroyed and no longer work so they're like all right nathan like er nothing works everything failed and this is the power grid and we need to get the power grid defense back up like now and so i'm like okay that sounds good that power grid it stayed down for two months like the, their cyber defense for two months longer than it was supposed to because like i was i got so sick at such a bad time and then, like, my manager is like, you have any idea, like, what our net loss on this is? And it was, I think it was, like, one to two million dollar net loss on the whole project. Like, it was bad. <laughs> Everyone was disappointed. And it was just, it was not a good week. It was not a good day. And even on, on my flight back, my flight got canceled. And so I spent the night while, like, super sick, like, uh, at the airport. And, like, I don't remember why, why I ended up not being able to get a room. It was, it was some complicated thing. But, man, I don't know. Power, power grids, they're not the most fun places to work at. Um, but those of you who get into this type of work, you're, you're going to ruin some things in the real world. And you're going to probably maybe feel bad about it. Some people don't feel bad about anything. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who, who have a uh, normal conscience, you'll probably feel about, bad about some things. So let's see. One thing that I'll also talk about is let's take a look at like hardware when we're talking about things like how do we get power? And then why is it a problem if hardware gets hacked for certain types of businesses? Has anyone seen uh, any of the newer Godzilla movies? You might not have. But, but if you have... I'll tell you about one of them, one of the newer Godzilla movies. There is a, a like a power plant and some like hackers hacked the power plant and like basically turned up the turbines or something and then the power grid like exploded and then like Godzilla came out of the nuclear waste or something crazy. <laughs> uh, but the, the silly thing ab uh, about that is the defense that i used to do for like power grids and whatnot is the defense against those types of attacks that they you know made a movie with godzilla about except for of course like godzilla's not going to come out it's just going to be everyone's going to have a bad day and get depressed if a power grid goes down and then people are going to not have power for a long time things like that um <laughs> oh no someone says that they ruined some bmw control modules after pro oh no <laughs> so yeah it sounds like some of you have been there Ooh. Ooh, that's that sounds stressful, especially when like it, get, it hits management and everyone's like, "We have this problem. What did you do?" 
<laughs> and then the labor costs associated with the repair of the mistake on top of the fact that, you know, man, that's crazy. So anyways, power grids. Let's say that this is a power grid. Um, we're going to say this is a, I don't know, who, who cares what kind of power grid? This this will be a, a sol not solar, uh, wind. So this is a wind power grid. Well, if we have windmills, windmills, they have to basically run on something, right? So we have to have more or less a special like data center. So we've got uh, got some windmills here. Oh, another windmill. So I always have more than one windmill. Now, of course, I'm not going to draw like 500 windmills. They kind of look like flowers, don't they? Like little little daisies or something. So we're going to take our daisy windmills and we are going to say that we have a uh, we have to have a data center to basically make sure that everything runs. So if we have windmills and we have data center, the data center it has to communicate with the windmills hardware. So the windmills have computing engines and they will also use some forms of like machine learning depending on the type of windmill and then also data centers they also have well computing systems at mass at scale like thousands of them hundreds of thousands of them millions of them really depends on the data center and when we're talking about power grids we actually have a, an interesting thing where power grids have to have we could we could illustrate it this way. I'm gonna make uh, one of these like red. So we're gonna draw a little red outline with this data center right here, and then we have maybe another data center. So if we have two data centers, this is how an power grid is built more or less they have to have two data centers uh, I'm doing a visual representation here sometimes some of the infrastructure lives in the same building but it still has to be isolated at the hardware level in some way shape form or capacity and so let's take a look at you know why do they have these two separate data centers at enterprises and organizations like you know power grids well this is something that we call a we have to have what's called a dark site that is an environment that never connects to the internet ever it can't connect to the internet and then they have to make sure that there are like protocols and systems and things and other things and things and things and things and things, and things that make sure that like the internet is not introduced to the dark site and so part of power grid defense is understanding how to defend a dark site the good question uh, how did you get started in and learn ot systems that's a good question how did i get into these types of systems for working with like dark sites and different things like this i got into this because i went into sim and SIM, Security Information Event Management, is sort of like a macro in the DevSecOps space. And SIM is something that basically has to be integrated into all development and integrated into all operations. And I am a SIM redundancy and high availability and incidents response and disaster recovery specialist. I have like a really unique specialization. I don't even know how I built that specialization. It kind of just happened by chance in terms of how I built the specialization because I, I guess I worked in a network operations center and working in a network operations center is where I built a custom ground up sim for that company at the time. And I built a, I, I helped build a data center uh, ecosystem for like a cloud at that company. And then after that, that's when I started getting into like uh, stuff like this dark site work. Uh, but if, if, if anyone wanted to get into cloud, getting into cloud engineering is a good I guess 
way to ease into work like this. So if someone wanted to go become a cloud engineer or a cloud security engineer, that will push you into the space of what I'm illustrating right here, because that's a good question. Not everyone knows what any of this even is. So a dark site, what in the world is a dark site? No internet, can't have internet. Worst idea ever, don't do it. Alternatively, we have a facility where all of the uh, staffing are, more or less, and operate. So we have our standard staffing facility, and this does have internet, right? So I guess I can even uh, say, And of course, I'm kind of dumbing this down a little bit because I don't want to spend too long going on because this stuff's real complicated if I don't simplify it. Uh, so we have no internet on the dark site, and then the other one has internet right here. And whenever someone wants to do, say, like an update on the dark site, this so this this is where I probably started refining my DevSecOps is because of dark sites, because dark sites you have to do all of your testing and development and you know all of this stuff in a separate isolated little environment. So then what one another thing that you have to do is we're going to add another thing because power grids require this to get data into the the dark site. So how do we get data into the dark site? we have to have another one, another uh, s uh, data infrastructure, basically. And this one is purely for testing. And the important part behind this is that if we are taking a look at trying to get just simple updates into a dark site. We can't just send simple updates to a dark site. Like not only does that put a dark site, you know, and the windmills and all this stuff in jeopardy, uh, like a serious security issue, uh, but some other issues that we run into with just, you know, not testing. We, we, we just need to test everything. Uh, we don't want the power grid to go down because then there goes everyone's power period all over the grid uh, so you, you test 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 so what happens is we want to update we create a test environment and then if the test is successful then we do the exact same thing that produced a successful test like the exact same update and then we migrate that update over to the data center and so that's how we do updates. And then we automate the, the updates in the staffing facility. So the staffing facility, you know, that's just like automated updates, make sure that it's running, make sure that it's not going down, but never ever connect a dark site to the internet and try to do automated there. So if anyone ever wondered where in the world does the Olympiads architecture come from is that the Olympiads architecture has this design built directly into it so that you can do DevSecOps for any type of business environment. Because I come from like high security. Like I come from like maximum security development. Um, aside from, what haven't I worked on? I've worked on space infrastructure. I've worked on power infrastructure. Uh, I haven't worked on like missile bases, but I, I've worked with people working on missile bases and, and missile systems and things like that. Um, it really just depends on uh, what's going on. Because I, what I don't have is I don't have a security clearance. Uh, I've done civilian military, civilian government, civilian everything. So that has pushed me out of the security clearance space. So for anyone who's coming from the military, anyone who has a security clearance honestly that in some ways is more valuable than having like five years of experience uh, i'll tell you that because like i don't have a security clearance and it's barred me from so many things that if i just had that even if i didn't know what i was doing there are just some jobs that i could do and that i could get just because i got the security clearance um, if anyone has an opportunity to get a security clearance uh, of some sort uh, then that is an incredibly valuable thing. Um, so hardware hacking, the thing about like 
dark sites and other facilities is whatever you're testing on is probably not the same infrastructure and architecture as whatever is living in the dark site because budget is a weird thing and most power grids most power grids aren't going to pay for testing infrastructure that like they want you to try to find the, the most affordable and lowest cost way humanly possible to do the testing so that there's little to no cost involved with the testing for migrating data into say like this type of, of, of data model. So, you know, in, in professional practice, if you don't know how to work with, like make any type of processor work together, you would not be able to do this job right here that I'm explaining. Uh, it's just not something that you'll be able to really, you'll learn it on the job, you can learn it on the job, but you'll by the time you're done doing it, you will know these things. <laughs> you'll know multi-architecture, you'll learn how to deal with you know different types of compatibilities, and you'll have to learn how to migrate something from say like an ARM platform over to an x86 platform, or like an AMD tool over to a, there are certain like, Oftentimes dark sites will use processor types that are not AMD or Intel. And I'm just gonna tell everyone the reason why is because if you use hardware at a company that is not very well adopted, period, it's also the least likely infrastructure to get hacked. And so a lot of times like dark sites, they'll have just really odd architectures that make almost no sense in the dark site because then if something or someone gets in there or there's a packet that's built and then ends up running in that environment it won't run on a on a processor it wasn't written for so i'm going to say that again attacks will not work or run on processor types that they were not written for or built for attacks are usually delivered in what are called payloads and so if you're trying to get a cybersecurity job you're defending against payloads or if you're doing pen testing you're building and delivering payloads which means that your goal is to impact hardware and if your payload is not compatible with certain types of hardware then your payload's not going to work and then also if you're creating architecture to defend and you understand these things then you can basically create stuff that most payloads simply won't run on and so if you're trying to do dark site engineering Something like ARM makes a whole lot of sense for dark site engineering because no one makes anything for ARM barely, but then that does introduce security risks. Believe it or not, NVIDIA buying ARM for $40 billion is a massive security risk for the entire world. I don't really talk about that very much, I guess, but ultimately, it is one of the biggest security risks on the planet that an NVIDIA bought ARM because that means that the adoption rate for ARM is going to skyrocket, which is good for people trying to get jobs, good for people who are trying to like do skills and things like that, but for our standard end users, for large businesses that are getting targeted for some of these other things, we're introducing new vectors, new open doors, new opportunities for people to come in and attack. Um, at scale and you know while we make everything more accessible for consumers and customers we make everything more accessible for attackers as well because most attackers are not that sophisticated the ones who are sophisticated if they're doing an attack then they usually make sure that they're gonna get something good out of it but most people who are just doing like oh yeah I'm gonna try to hack this thing most people just use phishing attacks so if, like over 90% of cyber attacks start with phishing, phishing's not even technical. And that means like, I don't know if anyone's ever watched like 90 Day Fiance, uh, but there's this lady who got like catfished. People have heard of catfishing before. That's a hacker, <laughs> that's social engineering. That's using phishing to influence a person in a negative way, so those are hackers. A lot of our hackers are online scammers, online, you know, like fishers, people like that, trying to manipulate and stuff, don't even know a lick of code. Like maybe they can take someone else's code. Like I'll tell you what, there's, there's something called Crypto Wall, it was a really bad piece of malware. And what attackers would do is, someone wrote that piece of malware, but what 
other attackers started doing is they would grab crypto wall and then send crypto wall to people that they didn't like hoping that crypto wall would impact their target without even knowing how crypto wall works without even knowing if it would impact the environment they're sending it to not even know what crypto wall is and so you you know when i, I used to uh, clean up crypto wall attacks i did a lot of that and so when you're trying to clean up crypto wall attacks you'll find that the vast majority of people trying to de deploy them just don't know what they're doing anyways so it's like oh well there's another one set up some filters set up some things to monitor for the for the binary that they're using in the packages so on and so forth uh, you got to target binary when you're talking about things like malware because when you're looking at um, like file names or file locations people try to make like packages like they change the name of the package, do different things to the package. So, you, you know, when you're doing malware analysis, you want to really start to understand binary. What does that bring us to? Binary is the piece that talks to the hardware. And so the best attackers understand that the binary is almost the only thing that matters in a payload. Doesn't matter what language it's written in, doesn't matter what XYZ it's done is, do you know how to create a package or a payload that's going to influence hardware with a binary response that's very specific to your goals and then you know if that's what hacking is if hacking is all about making the right binary do the right things to the hardware that means that it doesn't matter if it's python or golang doesn't matter if it's c sharp doesn't matter if it's you know if you're using like pre-built doesn't matter as long as whatever you're doing creates the binary translation you're trying to do Hacking is binary translation and manipulation, and manipulating all hardware, manipulating all software, always goes back to binary, always goes back to the processor architecture, because binary is the part that makes like the processor do the things that cause whatever is happening. It's a lot of information. <laughs> so... I just dropped a whole bunch of information on everyone today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping it up. Um, but what we're going to get into next week, so the homework today for the first time, uh, for those watching, thing that you can try out, try to do, is I encourage you, if you have a Raspberry Pi, try to make something like Steam work on the Raspberry Pi. If you don't have a Raspberry Pi, try to make something like, Raspberry Pi OS work in a virtual machine. And there you go. Those are things that shouldn't work with the different types of hardware. And I want you to start playing around with compatibility and making things compatible at stuff that they aren't really supposed to be compatible with. And I, ultimately, anyone who's in the Facebook group, feel free to post your hacks. Uh, maybe that's something that I start encouraging is, you know, post your weekly hacks. So maybe we start talking about um, weekly hacks, post your weekly hacks, and uh, that would be a fun thing. And then we can do reviews of everyone's weekly hacks every Friday. So if you want your hack to get spotlighted next Friday, we'll do this for the first time. Then we'll spotlight the hacks from last week. And we are going to hack video games next week. Uh, if anyone wants a little sneak peek of that, um, as I've mentioned in the past, like I learned most of my hacking stuff historically from video games. It's just, you know, video games, they're made out of code, they run on hardware. And if, you, if anyone's ever built, like for those who've built gaming rigs and things like that, you already have architecture experience. And if you've ever modded a game, like if you've ever played like Skyrim, um, like, actually, let's see. Anyone who's uh, seen a Skyrim before knows that Skyrim has this like I want to see if I can find the well it, ha it has this thing that lets you like take a look at mods that people made mods are hacking because someone's manipulating the game now some some games allow things like mods some games don't allow things like mods uh, but if anyone's ever if, if anyone's not heard of Skyrim um, next week I'm going to talk about things where we run into hacking with video games and why I personally think that hacking video games is one of the best ethical ways to learn real world hacking because if you buy a game you can do things with your own resource files legally uh, it's, it's just that you know you can't like go on an online game and hack someone's infrastructure but if you get like Skyrim you're not like 
it's not like Overwatch and you're coming in and hacking people's games and stuff like that, uh, which and which is why even Skyrim encourages it and encourages hacking their game because they found that people enjoy it. So people like hacking even in games. So that I mean, and that's the thing that really kind of kicked me off on it. Um, <laughs> I I still play Skyrim too in 2020. <laughs> Um, the, the Thomas the Train mod, I have not seen that. I wonder if I can see Community Hub. I have to look this up. <laughs> View page. Thomas the Train engine? That sounds hilarious. So, like, let's see. This is the, the community page. I'll look that up sometime. That sounds hilarious. Uh, but we're going to also learn how, how can you hack games with the Raspberry Pi? How can you take code and build an open source game from ground up uh, and then you know manipulate elements in the game using a Raspberry Pi and then for those who don't have a Raspberry Pi how can you basically hack like Steam games we're going to talk about that stuff uh, because my favorite way to hack is with video games that's one of the reasons why we are the Ethical Hackers Guild and um, I, I upgraded my rig so that I can start doing things like streaming and stuff like that. So we're, we're going to start spending more time on like video game hacking and making like video games compatible with different types of architecture. Because I'm trying to find the most fun ways to build the most advanced skills on the planet. And if I could build a six-figure job on video game skills, then anyone can. So there you go. And that's why we're doing it, because it's, it's the same knowledge. It's the same stuff with enterprise tools. It's just a lot more interesting than gives you something fun to look forward to. <laughs> so anyways, uh, does anyone have any uh, last questions uh, before we end this session and get ready for, for next week when we start hacking some stuff? There might not be any. It's been a long session. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has uh, attended and participated. And hopefully you learned something. And go hack some stuff. Go make some things compatible on systems that they shouldn't be compatible with. And I want to see everyone making everything compatible on anything and everything. Because that is the mission I'm sending you on. So, have a good week. We'll be in touch. <laughs>